Too full. Too full. <laughs> we'll call back to order the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners meeting here in Yarrington on Thursday, March 24th. Uh, we closed out agenda item 6 before our lunch break and we'll open with agenda item 10, uh, which is a series of reports. These are all informational. 10A will be our bighorn sheep disease surveillance and herd performance from 2012 <coughs> to 15. Uh, informational item, wildlife specialist Mike Cox. The department will provide a presentation depicting its bighorn sheep herd response over time in relation to the disease exposure, environmental factors, and other variables. This presentation will cover information developed from data collected over the last three years. Mr. Cox, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Drew, Mike Cox, the game staff biologist. We've been collecting a lot of information the last few years um, on pathogens that our big horn herds have or don't have. And this, this time I've kind of tied into the information we have on how the herds are doing with or without those diseases and wanted to share that with you. Dr. Perry Wolf wish she could be here. She's uh, in Phoenix doing some, uh, giving a training class. So at the beginning, I'm gonna try to uh, share some information she probably would have given if she was here. Just wanna give a quick overview of what the main disease that we're looking for when we go out and do our surveillance on our bighorn herds. Uh, current phrase is the polymicrobial pneumonia. It's a complex of bacteria and mycoplasma that are causing our disease events. And the primary pathogen that we think initiates uh, this infection is, is mycoplasma over pneumonia. Uh, we're gonna, you're gonna hear me just call it MOVI for short. The process of what that mycoplasma does is it causes the dysfunction of the cilia in your throat in the larynx. And that allows other bacteria that are part of this polymicrobial pneumonia to follow down through the throat and into the lungs <coughs> and cause pneumonia. Um, so this is what happens when a herd that has not been exposed to mycoplasma, this is at least our theory and what we've seen um, actually play out <coughs> in many of our herds and throughout the West. Got a herd that's never been exposed to it and either from domestic sheep or goats or a wandering bighorn that is from a herd that does have those pathogens, comes in contact. It could be nose to nose, it could be aerosol from a uh, short distance from coughing. They transmit the, the pathogen to the herd that's naive to it. Uh, we potentially can have an all age die off, which we'll go over. It could be uh, a few animals dying, it could be 75% of the herd die, or 100%. The worst of it is because we do see recoveries in some situations. Some situations we've got animals that survive. They build an immune response to the pathogen and some will be shedding the disease. So that's why you keep your kids at home if they're sick. You don't take them to the uh, the nursery or the school so they're not shedding on all the other kids. Um, but when these, these ewes come into contact with other ewes during their nursery groups, um, they may be, some of these other ewes may be clean, but uh, they give the bug to uh, her and then their lambs get it. And we start to see this reoccurring uh, every year poor lamb recruitment. Um, and it can be for several years or, uh, or longer. So that is what we're trying to understand and why we're doing a lot of this surveillance, is to see which herds 
have the mycoplasma and the other bacteria and look at their herd response and try to figure out why some herds do well and others don't, don't do so hot. Well, part of our surveillance, the primary efforts in our surveillance when we capture the animals is we get a nasal swab and that nasal swab allows us to look at the DNA of this mycoplasma and that is the one way that we determine if there's active shedding of the, of the <coughs> pathogen in that herd. We also collect blood uh, and that tells us if there's been an immune response that has been uh, developed by the animal to fight off the, the pathogens, the bugs, and um, hopefully allow them to survive. I was kind of, uh, as I normally do when I generate numbers, I was kind of shocked at this number. So I went through all the different main populations that we have. 47% of all of our herds have experienced a disease event, which either is lamb loss only or adult and lamb losses. Nearly 50%. It's not a, a herd here and a herd there. Now, again, you're going to see the responses are not always a Hayes Canyon or an East Humboldt's or whatever, or a Montana's, but uh, it's out there and it's, it's, uh, it's probably going to continue to grow. So the, these different categories of herd responses that you'll see are one uh, all-age disease event, from one to multiple years of poor lamb recruitment, and we never see herd recovery, at least until now. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. And that happens a lot throughout the West. We've got herds, Colorado, Montana, they're going, they're going on 25 years, and they've done nothing. <clears throat> uh, they may have 40, 50 animals left. They're just sitting there. Lamb recruitment maybe pops up every third year, fourth year, but Pretty much, they're in single-digit land recruitment. Uh, an all-age die-off with a complete loss. That's what we had in the Hayes Canyon. Uh, a little less severe, we actually get recovery to uh, pre close to or near pre-disease event population levels. Uh, the Mormons. And then some, we, we barely detect a population impact but yet we de detect the mycoplasma in the herd. There's a lot of things we don't know yet, even though we've uh, collected a lot of data, and there is a lot of variation among the herds of how they deal with the pathogens and their outcomes. We're starting to work west-wide with other states, uh, researchers, to look at the pathogen itself. Is there something about the different strains, even though there's this mycoplasma, there's a different strain of mycoplasma that may affect different herds, probably because it came from a different source. And then there's all kinds of different variables that the herds have that, that can affect their, uh, their ability to fight off the bug and, and recover. So the last three years, we've been ramping up our efforts to sample more herds that we haven't touched yet, that we don't know anything about. Uh, last year, we we sampled over 200 animals from 23 herds. Um, starting to put more information, or collars out there to get more movement information, interaction, and survival. So this map shows whether herds have this mycoplasma or not. So the red uh, are herds that have been uh, affected, stricken, exposed to the mycoplasma. The green are herds that we've sampled and continue to be clean and healthy. The yellow are herds that we have not sampled yet. Uh, and I'm, you're going to see more and more that I'm going to be showing you the adjacent states herds that we've, we've shared our, our goodness and badness and they've, they've done it to us too. So we did a big effort here in southern Lincoln County and northern Clark County last year. 2014, a uh, big push to get 
mineral and Esmeralda County herds sampled. Um, and really, if you look at southern Nevada and along the California border, the muddies is the only one that has not been affected. And again, a lot of things I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Mike, is this the same disease that you told us about three or four years ago that started with the California herd and you know, we started looking in Nevada? Is, that what, is this what the result has been? Uh, so wasn't that, wasn't that kind of a pneumonia? Yep. So I recall yep. the way you... Yeah, it was in, it was in California's Mojave Desert herds. Right, right at the Mojave Desert. Uh, we think probably the linkage to us was the South Spring Range, Devil Peak, uh, Mount Potosi area. And then, when you first started testing, you didn't have this kind of result, though, as I recall, did you? No. Um, it has spread. The obviously. more we look, the more we find, and a, a lot of variation. So even though you're going to see a lot of red, uh, doesn't mean those herds are all uh, been hit hard. But uh, we just need to do a, a good baseline assessment of, of what's been exposed and what isn't. Uh, so anyway, so that is kind of southern Nevada. Uh, this is another odd one is uh, Mount Moriah, the North Snake Range, has been exposed to mycoplasma probably because of us. Uh, we shared the East Humboldt sheep over there in 2006, and it's actually the same strain as the East Humboldt's and Ruby's had um, before they had experienced the 0910 die-off. <coughs> but yet the South Snake Range, Great Basin National Park, uh, now, it's been three, four years since we sampled it, but uh, every time we sample, uh, they, they seem to be clean, although that herd doesn't go anywhere. Uh, the north part of the state, uh, we've got uh, still a, a few more California herds that we'd like to sample. It's been a few years since we've uh, sampled, like the Calicos, uh, the Granites. Uh, the Jacksons, but you've got now the Montanas um, was exposed to mycoplasma. Uh, hopefully that that herd does no longer exist, and uh, and that green that green thing below it. Let's hope that that continues to be green. The double H's. Um, okay, the next one is. Some strain typing, we don't have all the strain typing back from the samples we collected in 2015. Uh, getting back to uh, Commissioner Young, again, I, I uh, identified down the south end, not only our herds that have the, uh, what's called the Mojave strain, which is that uh, deep purple blue, blue purple, but you can see all the California herds that have the same strain, and the black mountains across Lake Mojave in Arizona. The uh, sheep range is a different strain. Uh, the, the strain that we detected on the Nevada test and training range that we sampled this last fall is different uh, from the strain in Mineral and Esmeralda County, which uh, we were kind of surprised. Uh, I don't understand why there's different strains with so close of the White Pine Range and Duckwater Hills with the Grant Range and North Pancakes, but it's different. Um, and uh, this is a different strain from the Badlands and the Santa Rosas. And the strain that we got from the Montanas is different from the Santa Rosas. So there, there wasn't a bighorn from the Santa Rosas that gave it to the Montanas. So we'll be building more upon this. A lot of the researchers do think that the strain type, there's something about it, and there's going to be some more <coughs> geneticists digging into the, the strain of these mycoplasmas. And, um, this is the slide that I love to show, and it, <coughs> it indicates uh, the potential for these diseases to be spread, even though you go back here, different strains, uh, you would think that that all be the same strain, but this is a 20-mile buffer on around every herd, and you pretty much have one big meta population in the state, and that spills over into California, 
and, and into Arizona. So the potential does exist for a lot of these things to be circulated. This is the slide that I'm going to use quite a bit that's going to get right into the heart of the herd response to the pathogen exposure. Same colors, the green are herds that uh, we've tested and are clean, yellow we have not tested yet, red are the herds that, that have mycoplasma. This axis right here is representing the lamb ratio for California bighorn herds that, that I feel is necessary to maintain the herd, to maintain a stable herd. You gotta have at least 30 ewes per 100, or 30 lambs per 100 ewes to maintain, to maintain a stable herd. So the end of these bars is what the lamb ratio was from our surveys either last year or the year before. Uh, so you, these are all good. They're between 40 and 50. That's what we'd like to see, and that's pretty typical of the long-term average. Uh, the two herds, we got four herds that are below what, what I call maintenance lamb ratios, uh, the high rock calicos, Santa Rosa snowstorms, and the sheep creeks on the bottom. With snowstorms and Santa Rosa's having mycoplasma throughout their subherds, uh, the snowstorms still in the single digit lamb ratios. Uh, and that, that herd continues to decline with only about 40 animals remaining in the herd. So we wanted to see how much variation we have between those, those populations that are doing well and don't have the bug and those herds that aren't doing well that do have the bug. Uh, this graph makes somewhat sense. The next, uh, they don't. And uh, <coughs> so in the Rockies, oh, well, let me just go back and just, this is uh, something that's important. So the Montanas, this is data just from last September, August, that Ed collected. And um, it just shows you how fast things can happen. Great lamb ratio last September. Uh, the Montana herd doesn't exist anymore. And it's just been six months, seven months. So uh, for Rockies, most of our herds have been exposed to mycoplasma. Again, that one anomaly is the South Snake Range, Great Basin National Park at the bottom. Um, none of those herds are doing well long term, although the rubies had a tremendous spike in, in lamb numbers this year. Uh, and it, it'll be interesting to see if that's just a one-year anomaly or not. But uh, East Humboldt's, unfortunately, uh, is experiencing a disease event. Uh, we detected that back in September, October. We're going to hopefully be doing a flight uh, next month. So we did detect the mountain goat strain that was contracted by our a naive bighorn from Alberta in the East Humboldt, which we hypothesized that would happen, whether it was two years after the release or 10 years. Um, so it happened, it happened two years after. And uh, we don't know the extent of the disease event, but we, we, we uh, based on the cow collared animals, we probably lost at least 50% of the East Humboldt herd. All right, so I split up the deserts because there's so many into three different groups. This is central Nevada, basically from Fallon all the way over to uh, the Grant Range in eastern part of Nye County, and everything in between all the way down to uh, the monitors in Highway 6. A lot of herds we haven't sampled yet. Um, you can see we've got now some herds that are defying the odds. This is the Fairview Slate Sand Springs, Unit 181. Uh, they're, they're a herd that had one year of poor lamb recruitment, and they really haven't looked back since. They've had good lamb recruitment. That population continues to build. Uh, white pine, duckwater, north pancakes continues to str struggle, along with the adjacent Grant Range. Pancakes which had four years of poor lamb recruitment, 
Uh, now they're back on the positive side, but again, they've been exposed. So uh, we're starting to see now this, this variation of some herds uh, kick the habit and other herds just, just stay in the gutter and they just can't find their way out of that, that disease uh, cycle. And their lambs born, they're born, all of them, typical numbers, every lamb, you has a lamb, but by three, four months, the uh, majority of them are dead from pneumonia. West Central, which is that mineral, Esmeralda County, along with uh, Mount Grant, East Walker, uh, most of that area, most of that metapopulation has been exposed, same strain type. Uh, although the East Walker River, we haven't sampled it for about three years, and we really don't have any good data from the Wasix or Mount Grant. But you can see the wide variation of populations doing well. Uh, and I, I spoke briefly about the uh, NTTR, the Nellis Test and Training Range, and the adjacent stone wall. We sampled that for the first time last fall. Uh, Department of Defense gave us permission to get out there. Different strain type as the herds to the northwest. This is now the second year that uh, we've seen near single digit lamb ratios, both on Stonewall and the, the test and training range proper. So we don't know if it's gonna last for another five years or next year they'll turn around and the bears are, are a part of that. And um, although we haven't had a survey in the, in the bears for two years, this is 2014 data. I, I surmise based on the positive test results from the animals captured in the bears that they, they probably had single digit lamb ratios this, this past winter. Um, so it's, uh, it's tough to be up here giving you all this bad news and, and not having a lot of answers. And then this is uh, a real tough one to talk about. This is Clark County primarily and, and Lincoln County herds. We, again, we sampled uh, over half of those herds this last two, two years and big push on the Lincoln County herds up here. Um, and majority of them have mycoplasma. Huge variation in herd response. Uh, we've got some of the herds along um, Pranagat Valley on Highway 93 that are they're doing game busters. Um, and then unfortunately, the, the worst of it is Spring Range, the McCulloughs, the El Dorados, the Rivers, and the Gold Beach. And we think what happened here, where we're seeing all those single digit lamb ratios. So the end, end of these bars is the lamb ratio. So they're, um, they're between zero and 10 lambs per 100. Is there was a second strain of mycoplasma that hit them. Um, so they, I'll take that back, Commissioner Young. We initially had the, what we call the Nevada strain in our herds and then the Mojave strain we think came in at some point in the last three years, that we didn't see a tremendous lamb ratio drop with them harboring and dealing with the Nevada strain. Once this Mojave strain hit the last couple of years, Pat Cummings was just seeing some, not only really poor lamb ratios, but sample sizes were a third to half of what he normally flies. And that's a big, big concern to me. That Pat has a very consistent survey pattern, and when he can't find the animals, that pretty much tells me they're dead. Um, so we, we may have experienced 40 to 50% losses in places like the Spring Range, the McCulloughs, the Rivers, the El Dorados. We won't know for another year, but um, that second strain, uh, it looked like they, it really had its impact. I went through all of our herd data, all of our models, taking into account our survey data, 
uh, necropsies that we've done, uh, observations from sportsmen, from biologists, and I think this is a conservative estimate of losses that we've probably had that are over and above what, we, we, what I would consider the standard average lamb ratio, lamb recruitment that we get. Uh, so potentially lost just deserts, or statewide, I'm sorry, uh, over a thousand sheep just the last couple years. Could be as high as 1,500. Um, and again, I, I wish I had more answers today, but as we collect this data, hopefully we can uh, learn more and, and try to prevent uh, <coughs> worse losses, I guess, in the future. So I want to close out and show you some long-term data trends from these herds that have been exposed and just kind of talk about what we could have done or maybe there wasn't anything we could have done. The McCulloughs, we do think, again, the Nevada strain came in uh, late 2000s at some point. Uh, the, the green is the population estimate over time. The yellow bars is the land the lamb ratio that we collect in the fall. Some years we don't we don't collect data. You can see that single digit lamb ratio from this past 2015 survey. McCullough has been on the skids for the last decade, and um, I it's just really frustrating to see that. Uh, and then we'll we're going to see more of this this trend of. Uh, probably was at its highest peak before uh, it, it took a dive and, and got, it, got exposed to uh, mycoplasma. Here's the, uh, what I call a rock star, Fairview Slate Sand Springs Monte Cristos. This was the initial disease event in 2006-07. Population pretty much was documented at the highest level. Uh, one poor year of lamb ratios in the following 2008. And then other than some real drought conditions that probably resulted in this lamb ratio, that population now has pretty much recovered to its pre-exposure level. The Mormons, of course we don't have any data on the pathogens, but we know for certain it went through a disease event in 1980 and 81. Um, we just don't have the, the disease profile. We lost a significant amount of that herd, and then it, it uh, really only had one poor year. Again, this, this 1987 <coughs> land ratio was, was probably drought related. <coughs> and it did have a, a secondary decline in the 90s, which could be attributed to disease, but we're not sure. That population now has since uh, recovered a bit, not to the point where it was. Um, this could be what herds that have just been stricken with mycoplasma, they may experience this over a 30, 40 year period. We don't know. Um, I'd like to think at least they could do this, but I can't say that all of them are going to be able to mount a recovery. I wanted to show the rivers quick based on, uh, again, Pat Cummings' survey that he conducted last fall. Population uh, in this herd, you know, we, we captured out of this herd more than any other herd for our translocations. So we, fed, we probably kept it fairly lean and mean. Uh, never allowed it to get too high. But when you look at these consistent, uh, this is total numbers and survey, pretty consistent. And when you see this huge drop from, from 2014 to 15, I really do think that's real. And that's about a 40% uh, reduction in survey to totals, which could reflect uh, the percent loss in the herd in the river mountains. Gaps Valley Range, it has mycoplasma. We don't know when it got exposed. We never really detected a drop in the lamb ratios. 
and and I can't believe that it probably had mycoplasma uh, probably no no more than five years ago because we've got other herds that were uh, clean nearby uh, all the way back to 2011 and 12. So nothing really caught our eye here of poor lamb recruitment. So it is doing really well in spite of it, and it keep, keeps growing. Um, and I'm a little fearful about that. So I think... That's it. Thanks, Mike. Questions? Commissioner Blake? Thanks for the presentation, Mike. The um, question I have is the disease strain that is in the McCullough's and the River Mountains, is it the same strain that has been documented in the sheep range? No, are they, they, different? they are different. Well, we do not have... We do not have a strain type uh, of the one in the sheep range. Um, I think that color was, I just had to give it a color, but um, we only got one sample the last time we captured in the sheep range um, three, four years ago, 2000, I don't know, it may have been longer, about five years ago. And we didn't get enough material for DNA work. But uh, we do have a strain type in the pint waters that is different from what is in those southern Clark County herds. And we suspect whatever is in the pint waters is likely the same strain as the sheep range. And is, is the sheep range, is that strain have a more negative effect on the population than the ones in the rivers? Which one is, they're all bad, but out of the two, I mean, is there, does one have a worse effect on it? Well, the sheep range, uh, although there's still gonna, always going to be speculation of what happened in the mid to late 80s, um, the fact does say that they, we went from eight, nine hundred to 200. So something happened. And I think a lot of it had to do with disease. Um, it's never gone back <coughs> over 300 animals. Now that could be suppressed by predation, could be a lot of things, but I do I do think disease is, is continuing to affect that herd because we, back in 2011, um, 25, 30 years after that, that event, we still had antibodies being mounted by those animals. So something continues to challenge their immune system even today, um, 25 years later, that uh, something is still being circulated. But it, is it worse? I, I don't know. Um, I am. I'm, I'm very concerned about those herds, the rivers, El Dorados, the colors, Spring Range, and and how long uh, these impacts will, will occur, and likely the adult loss. We just haven't seen this type of adult loss in deserts in, in my career. Um, obviously we've seen it in the Montanas, the East Humboldt's, the East Canyon, but people think that de deserts are a little bit uh, more uh, stronger, their immune system, something about their, their subspecies that uh, allows them to deal with these pathogens better than the Rockies in California. But when you get these multiple strains uh, jumping on them, I, they, they, they seem to be hit just as hard as, as some of the northern subspecies. Um, Time will tell. Yes, and the reason I ask is I was lucky enough to get invited on a hunt in the Muddies this year. And uh, down there on that hunt, the the amount of sheep I seen, the the herd looked great. I mean, I was looking at that, going, man, it, it scared me, you know, because it's right in the middle of all these disease events that have taken place. And although I'm concerned about all these other units around it, to me, 
I mean, we're dealing with that, but I'm really concerned about the muddies and how we, there's probably no other way that we can isolate that population, but if there was a place that we could go with some of those sheep um, that would have a less, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is to it, but I just, I'm nervous as hell about the muddies. Yeah, we've been that way for a decade. Yeah. Um, there's, yes, we're, we're, we've given a lot of sheep away. Um, <clears throat> what we don't want to do is, is throw good sheep after bad. And if, if we have some good spots to take them uh, to and let them be a part of a restoration effort, we will. Utah's been inquiring again, and uh, we'll, we'll give them an open. With open arms, we'll, we'll share those. Um, yeah, I, crazy idea is to extend that tortoise fence along North Shore Road and make it an eight-foot high fence <laughs> and keep those river sheep to the south. But, but that's the kind of crazy uh, ideas that uh, we got left to try to keep that herd from succumbing. And again, we don't know how they'll affect, be affected or how they'll respond. But because of what's happened in the rivers, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty scared too. Additional questions for Mike? Schmidt? Um, I have a couple questions. Um, the populations that aren't, have not been surveyed, it sounds like we've, we have information from the 1980s. It's, I'm confused as to why there's not all the population, all the populations haven't been surveyed. Is it just because there are um, different priorities? And then also, um, have I mean, I, I guess we haven't really, I, I'm trying to understand if there's been any kind of research done into some type of vaccination or some type of preventative care for the sheep moving forward. Or, I mean, I'm sure this is kind of a general question, but it comes to mind in hearing all of the, the statistics that are out there right now. Good questions. Um, there has been, uh, well, in terms of back to sampling, we have, we have uh, a lot of herds. Um, we basically have a hundred different herds and it takes a lot of time and money and staffing to do the sampling effort we need. And we just, uh, we've been ramping it up, but probably, um, I won't take complete blame um, but our restoration efforts were definitely a priority in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and, and most of my career. And so when things were good, I guess if, if uh, I ran into this trying to buy a new house, you know, if your sewer line is never backed up, why bother and look at it? And the only time you look at it is when it does. So we were running hard doing great things for bighorn sheep, restoring them to so many places they were extirpated. We, uh, we did not take time to start doing a baseline surveillance of our herds really up until the last five, six years. And because of this, just the magnitude of effort to get a certain amount of sample size that the data is credible. Um, it's going to take us another three, four years to get all of our herds surveyed and sampled. Um, there has been a ton of work by pathologists, veterinarians, uh, geneticists looking at ways that we can inoculate, uh, reduce the impacts of the bacteria. Uh, there's been research to even change the, the bacteria in domestic sheep and goats that could one day interact with wild sheep to change their bacteria from being virulent to non-virulent. And so far, really none of it works. And one of the issues with trying to inoculate wild sheep is unless you get 100% of them, um, it, do, it does you no good. You can, you can capture 99 of the 100 animals in that herd, and if that one animal you don't capture, you don't inoculate, and it's shedding uh, three months after that inoculation, uh, that, that immune system is going to get compromised and, and it's over. 
So there still continues to be research west-wide, um, but there is not a lot of money in it. There's, there's uh, not a lot of money put into that effort. And, uh, but there's some ideas out there recently to do some different things and uh, hopefully that they'll get to do some trials. So right now, and it's been West-wide agreed upon uh, through WAFA that our best management solution right now, and it's not a great one, is separation. Is separation from wild sheep that have the disease, from naive sheep that don't, and from domestic sheep that have the disease, from naive wild sheep that, that don't. And we can keep those distances, but that slide with the 20 mile buffer, uh, give it a few years and uh, we, we don't have enough separation right now really long term to, to allow that management uh, plan to work. So um, I am always with an open ear to, to an idea that probably is not going to be any crazier than I thought of, like, like again, putting that tortoise fence up another six feet. Mr. Moran, I think you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike, there, I, I thought that if I saw it right on that, on one of those slides on the Paranagate and the Heiko herds, <clears throat> they were infected but had real high lamb ratios. What's the, what's the what's story your there? take on that? Yeah. Again, we were, we're, we need to dig into that. And, and there's a west-wide effort that we're part of. Um, we call it a disease management venture. And we're, there's other herds like that in the west. Almost every state has a herd that is doing well in spite of, in spite of the pathogens that they've been exposed to. So we don't know exactly. It could be the strain type uh, of, the, of the pathogen itself that is non-virulent. Uh, we just don't know. Could be the genetics of the bighorn. Maybe they're unique. Maybe it's a combination of where they came from. But uh, there's a lot, lot more of those herds than we thought um, after we started doing surveillance that are doing well in the face of these pathogens that are being circulated in their herd. Additional questions, Ms. Sean? I do have another question. Um, <coughs> So do you, when you're looking at your populations with different strains, are you finding that sometimes you've ever resurveyed an area and found the same, for the same population, you resurvey it, and it is now carrying a unique or different strain? Yeah, like those... The strains maybe mutating or changing, similar to like our, our flu strain or virus? Yes, strain there's the, the, the okay. primary pathologist that we send all of our samples to uh, up at Washington State University. He has seen mutations occur. They're slight. They're very slight, um, again, over a decade uh, or so. But we have seen different strains come in from a different source after an initial strain is there. So that's what impacted those Southern Nevada herds so severely is there was a, they were dealing with the strain OK that they initially got hit with. Then there was a second one came in. Um, so it's like someone with the flu, and then they, they get type A, or they have the, a cold, they get type A flu, and then, and then a virus, and now they got pneumonia, and now they're on the deathbed. So it, it just it, every time something new comes in, it looks like it, it's going to make things worse. But mutations are real, and they're, they're going to continue to happen. Additional questions? Right. Thanks, Mike. I know it's a tough subject, but we appreciate the update. Okay, we'll go ahead and close item 10A. Open item 10B, Tag Allocation Application Hunt Committee Report, Commissioner and Committee Chair Johnston. It's informational. He's actually got um, a PowerPoint to load up, so let's uh, break until right at 3.30, and I'll keep that tight. So six minutes.